Hi, welcome to Moments with Marilyn. I'm your host, Marilyn Boyer, the mom of 14 homeschool kids. I absolutely love young moms, and it's my passion to provide you with tips and tools to make your journey easier. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today, we're close to Independence Day. It's coming up in a week or so, and I just wanted to share with you some information you might not know that you could share with your kids. And it's so important that our kids understand about the founders of our country because in colleges all across the land, they are teaching kids that the founders were deists and atheists, and that is so untrue. And we don't have to wonder about that because the, the founders were so prolific. They wrote so much, and we can rely on their own words for what they believed. And you know, um, I guess I was inspired when I heard David Barton from Wall Builders speaking years ago about the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And he showed a picture of the signing, and he asked, how many people can identify more than you know, one or two of these signers? And I knew Benjamin Franklin, I knew Thomas Jefferson, the least religious of all of them, and I think I knew John Hancock, but I didn't know any of the others. And then he told a couple stories and it just like pricked my heart. I thought, wow, you know, these guys sacrificed so much for our freedom and we don't know anything about them today. You know, we don't read about them in our history books. We don't know their stories. So the Lord just, like I couldn't shake it. I just kept thinking about that. And then I ran into David Barton at another conference and I asked him about where he would suggest doing research because I wanted to look into this. And he suggested this eight, nine volume set of books that was written in 1824. And it was written by a man who personally interviewed either the signers, if they were still living, there were a few of them living, or descendants of the signers. So the information was just real primary source. And I started looking all around antique bookstores and, and antique sites online. And I finally pieced together all nine of those books. And it's just amazing. You know, that's where I started doing my research. And I wrote the book called For You They Signed. And it was like uncovering treasure, finding out about these guys and what they sacrificed for our freedom. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the book toward the end. But I just wanted to share some stuff that you can share with your family or you can share on your Independence Day celebration. And as I say, across colleges, they use a book called The Godless Constitution. And at the very end, it says, we've dispensed with the usual practice of footnoting because we all know the founders were deists. Ah, which is not true. You know, we've got their own writings. And as I did the research, I found that in their last will and testament, a lot of them wrote what they believed about Jesus Christ because they didn't want their posterity to ever question it or have any questions as to what they believed. So probably about 95% of them were born again believers. It's so amazing. And the only ones we ever hear about are Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, who probably were not Christian, but they definitely had a respect for the Bible. They read the Bible. When Thomas Jefferson was president, he put the Bible in place as the primary textbook in Washington, D.C. schools. They grew up in such a different time than us. They knew the Bible, they quoted the Bible. It was just a part of their growing up and a part of their thought processes. But on to some truly Christian signers. I wanna give you just a sampling. Robert Treat Payne of Massachusetts entered Harvard at age 14 to study theology. He graduated at age 18. He later became a chaplain to the New England troops during the French and Indian War. He preached in pulpits around Boston. It was said of him, Judge Payne was a firm believer in the divine origin of the Christian religion. He gave full credence to the scriptures as a revelation from God designed to instruct mankind in a knowledge of their duty and to guide them in the way to eternal happiness. Of William Ellery of Rhode Island, it was observed he studied the scriptures with reverence and diligence. Jonathan Edwards said of Roger Sherman, as an avowed professor of religion, he did not hesitate to appear openly in defense 
and maintain the peculiar doctrines of grace. He was exemplary in attending all the institutions of the gospel, in the practice of virtue in general, and in showing himself friendly to all good men. The volume which he consulted most especially was the Bible. It was his custom to purchase a Bible at the beginning of every session of Congress, to peruse it daily, and to present it to one of his children on his return. Ugh. Of Richard Lee, it was written, in the vigor of his mind, amid the honors of the world and its enjoyments, he had declared his belief in Jesus Christ as the savior of men. I'm looking down a lot because I want to give you these exact quotes so you can see what was said of them. Then I'm going to tell you what they said. Francis Lightfoot Lee of Virginia was placed at an early age under the care of Reverend Dr. Craig, a Scotch clergyman of eminent piety and learning. His excellent tutor not only educated his head but his heart and laid the foundation of character upon which the noble superstructure of his useful life was exhibited. Notice how many of these signers had early training in the scriptures. That, is, that was true of them. John Witherspoon was a minister of the gospel who trained other ministers, including some of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He published books of gospel sermons. He played major roles in two American editions of the Bible, including the one from 1791, which is considered to be America's first family Bible. He served on 100 committees. While doing so, he always wore clerical robes to remind the people that God was on America's side. Even when prospects looked really bleak during the war, he remained a beacon of hope. He was a strong believer in family prayer. He said, let me therefore earnestly recommend the faithful discharge and careful management of family duties as you regard the glory of God, the interest of his church, the advantage of your posterity, and your own final acceptance in the day of judgment. Benjamin Rush of Pennsylvania was the founder of the first Sunday school movement in America, and he helped start the first Bible society. He wanted to be able to put a Bible in the hands of every American and he helped invent stereotype printing to help accomplish this goal. He was strong on the early training of children in the scriptures. The early influence of his home was truly felt throughout his life. As he himself noted, his loving mother had paid strict attention to the morals and religious principles of her children. In fact, the reading of the word of God and the offering of daily prayers generally recurred every day. Francis Hopkinson's father died, and his mother took seriously his religious and intellectual education. Early on, he showed a love of music, and he studied the harpsichord. He became a church music director, and get this, he set all the psalms to music as America's first songbook. All the psalms. Can you imagine even Psalm 119 set to music? Thomas McKean was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. He once resided over a case where a man named John Roberts was sentenced to death after being found guilty of treason. Justice McKean delivered his sentence, and then he preached to the man an exhortation to accept Christ as his Savior right away before his death so that he could spend eternity in heaven rather than in hell. Right there in the courtroom. So that's what was said about them. That's some of the things they did. But listen to some of their own words. Samuel Adams said, I rely on the merits of Jesus Christ for a pardon for all my sins. Charles Carroll, on the mercy of my Redeemer, I rely for salvation and on his merits, not on the works I have done in obedience to his precepts. John Witherspoon, I entreat you in the most earnest manner to believe in Jesus Christ, for there is salvation in no other. Benjamin Rush, my only hope of salvation is in the infinite transcendent love of God manifested to the world by the death of his son upon the cross. Nothing but his blood will wash away my sins. Does this sound like deists and atheists? No. No. Richard Stockton said, I subscribe to the entire belief of the great and leading doctrines of the Christian religion, and I exhort that the course of life held up by the Christian system is calculated for the most complete happiness that can be obtained in this mortal state. 
When he learned that he had cancer, he wrote to his posterity and in much detail charged and exhorted them to remember the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. One more, Roger Sherman. I love this. See if this sounds like an atheist. I believe there is one living and true God existing in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that at the end of the world there will be a resurrection from the dead and a final judgment of all mankind when the righteous shall be publicly acquitted before Christ the judge and, the, and be admitted to everlasting life and glory and the wicked be sentenced to everlasting punishment. Now, guys, that is only a sampling. I've got a lot more in this book. Like I say, it was like a treasure hunt, researching this and finding out what a heritage we have in our country. And it, it just kind of breaks my heart that in colleges, they're being taught lies. They're being taught untruths based on nothing. We've got the writing of the founders. We don't have to wonder what they believed. You know, David Barton said that the beginning of a decay of society is when their history is taken from them. And I see that happening now in our public schools. They're not teaching the history. They're the ones, the signers that you learn about in school are Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. You don't hear about um, these guys like Roger Sherman and Robert Treat Payne. So, did you also know the American Revolution was not merely about taxation without representation? That was one of 27 reasons, number 17, that's in the Declaration of Independence. Read it for yourself. We do it every Independence Day as part of our celebration. Much more important was that King George did not allow the colonists to create Bible societies, to print Bibles. He did not allow missionary societies to evangelize the Indians and he would not let them discontinue the practice of slavery. Religious freedom was premier, not taxation without representation. That was a tiny part of the reason, but that's what we hear about today. You know, when these signers of the Declaration of Independence placed their signatures on the Declaration, they knew they might be sacrificing their very lives. They didn't have to sign it, but they chose to. And King George gave orders to capture them. There was then a price on their heads. King George said he hoped to stamp out the rebellion in its infancy by capturing its leaders. Benjamin Franklin, at the time of the signing, was, said to, to, was heard to say, quote, we must all hang together or we will hang separately. And they knew that. If their efforts were not successful, they would hang. It was a serious thing, and they knew it. But let me tell you a little bit about their sacrifices. Ugh. You know, it just, it, it breaks my heart that we don't know what these guys sacrificed to give us the country we have today. And we must teach our kids these things. Abraham Clark, be, he was from New Jersey. Besides laboring greatly to gather supplies General Washington's army needed, he had two sons who served as officers in the American army. Both were captured by the British. Because their father was a signer, they were subjected to especially brutal treatment, and they were confined on the British prison ship Jersey, where we lost more men than we did in battle from the treatment that they had, the loathsome treatment that they received. His son Thomas, he was a captain of the artillery, he was put in solitary confinement in a dark hole of the ship, and he was not well fed. He managed to stay alive only because fellow prisoners pushed him small bits of bread through the keyhole in the door. Back then, the keyhole, the keys were larger, the keyholes were larger. So they would push little bits of bread through. Abraham Clark was informed that the British held his sons captive and they would be released only if he deserted the American cause. He rejected their offer. His sons were later released on prisoner exchange, but they were emaciated. They did survive, but they were emaciated. The British were determined to make John Hart, who was also of New Jersey, their prisoner. He had 13 kids and a sick wife who had a debilitating disease. She could not get out of bed. His neighbors one day warned him the British were marching up his road to capture him, and they begged him to flee, saying he was too important to the cause. They pledged to take care of his wife and his children. He hesitated greatly, but at the last moment he fled to the woods and he was hunted with fury. 
He was often in desperate need of food. He never stayed anywhere for long. He lived in the woods, caves, hills. One night in December, the weather was really cold. He concealed himself in a cave with the presence of a dog for his companion, and the dog helped to keep him warm. Finally, when after the Battle of Princeton, when the British evacuated New Jersey, he was able to go home. He found that his wife had died his children were scattered by the British. His farm was pillaged and destroyed. His own health was poor, and he died before he saw victory at the end of the war. But he never repented the course he had taken. He had enlisted himself in a good cause, and in the darkest periods, he still believed in a righteous providence that would ultimately enable the cause to prevail and finally to triumph. Such were the men who forged our freedom, and we've forgotten them. Richard Stockton was taken prisoner by royalists, dragged from his bed at night, and carried to New York, where he was treated with indignity in a common prison in want for basic necessities. His health was destroyed, his property was destroyed, along with his extensive library, one of the best in the country at the time. George Reed of Delaware, there's a great story of a close escape. The British had captured Wilmington, and he was attempting to move his family to safety by crossing the Delaware River in a large barge. The barge ran aground because the tides, he had not carefully watched what the tides were going to be. He knew that the British had dispatched an armed barge in search of him. So he presented himself as a country gentleman returning to his home. And as it turned out, the Royal Navy actually assisted him by carrying his baggage, helping his wife, mother, and children up the steep bank. They did not realize till months later they'd let one of the most hunted men in the middle colonies slip through their fingers. Edward Rutledge of South Carolina was taken prisoner when the British seized Charleston. At the time, he was serving as captain of an artillery, ba artillery battalion. He was sent to Augustine, Florida, where they held the really dangerous rebels. He was released a year later to find that his own mother had been held by the British because of her goodwill to the American cause, an aged woman. Robert Morris had a very um, successful shipping industry. He personally gave more than $2 million to the cause. Now, $2 million is a lot of money today, but back then it was astronomical. He personally financed Washington's crossing the Delaware and the Battle of Yorktown out of his own pocket to pay the soldiers for their time. The story is told how George Washington used to rely on Robert Morris to raise funds to pay his men. One day, Morris was walking from his home to his counting house when he met a wealthy Quaker friend who had asked him what the news was. Morris said, the most important news today is that I require a certain sum, and you must let me have it. Your security is to be my note and my honor. The money from this loan was used by Washington in winning his surprise victory over the Hessians on the day after Christmas in 1776. His mansion was partially destroyed by the British. He was never repaid for the, the money that he gave from the country, and he ended up in debtor's prison as an old man, but he never complained. Thomas Nelson, and if you check my past podcast, we interviewed a great, great, great grandson of Thomas Nelson. He was from Virginia. He led the Virginia Brigade, brigades of 3,000 men at Yorktown. The British soldiers had taken refuge in Nelson's mansion. And during the siege, he noticed that while the Americans poured their shots thick and fast into every part of the town, they seemed to carefully avoid firing in the direction of his house. When he inquired why his house was spared, he was informed that it was out of personal regard to him. He at once begged them not to make any difference on that account, and at once a well-directed fire was opened upon it. He blew up his own mansion, all his possessions. Caesar Rodney is one of my favorite signers. From youth, he was plagued by a skin cancer. It was on his face, and if you see pictures of him, he had a green cloth that covered it up. They did not do much research for cancer in the colonies, but he was told that if he went to England, he would have good hope for a cure for his skin cancer. But he gave up his best chance to do that because of his dedication to the American cause. So he is famous for his long, night-long ride to cast his vote for independence. He was absent from Congress. 
1776 as he was a brigadier general and he led a campaign to squelch a loyalist uprising. He returned home one night feeling rather ill, only to find an urgent message from Thomas McKean that he was needed at the State House in the morning to break the deadlock vote for independence. He left 10 minutes later. He didn't even change clothes. He rode 80 miles on horseback through a driving thunderstorm. He said it was the worst thunderstorm he'd ever experienced. He stopped only to change horses. The next morning, Thomas McKean was pacing the floor as the session was about to begin, watching and realizing that the fate of the resolution depended on one sick man. John Hancock, the president, took the floor to open the session when everyone heard the sound of horses' hooves pounding the cobblestone pavement. Rodney entered. He was mud splattered. And when Delaware was called, he struggled to his feet. And he spoke, as I believe the voice of my constituents and of all sensible and honest men is in favor of independence, and my own judgment concurs, I vote for independence that he sunk exhausted into his chair, but his one vote made the difference. Just a few more, Oliver Walcott's one of my favorite. He served in the Connecticut militia, as well as being a member of the Continental Congress. He happened to be in New York when George Washington ordered the Declaration of Independence to be publicly read to the troops on July 9th. The New York Patriots were excited, and in their excitement, they pulled down the statue of King George. Oliver Walcott loaded up the broken pieces of the headless statue. He put them on a wagon and took them home to Connecticut with him. There, his wife, daughter, son, and neighbor ladies melted it down and made over 42,000 bullets. His 11-year-old daughter, Mary Ann, made 10,140 bullets by herself. Walcott then returned to Congress to add his signature to the Declaration of Independence and was made a general. He later used a lot of those very bullets to fight against the British and win at the Battle of Saratoga. Arthur Middleton of South Carolina was captured, imprisoned in St. Augustine for a year. His plantation was ravished. His valuable collection of paintings was stolen or rifled. Whatever the British couldn't sell, they, they mutilated. Carter Braxton of Virginia saw virtually every merchant ship he owned sunk or captured by the British. His mansion, Cherokee, was destroyed by fire. Although he lost his wealth, he was forced to sell his land. He continued to serve in the Virginia legislature. William Ellery of Rhode Island, his Newport home was burned. William Paca of Maryland poured thousands of dollars into clothing for the American soldiers. Thomas McKean of Delaware recalled to John Adams that he was hunted like a fox during the Revolution. And at one time, he was compelled to move his family five times in a few months. Francis Lewis of New York, the British galloped to Lewis's home so that they could, so he could, quote, get the hanging he deserved. They were angry to find him not home, so they took vengeance on his elderly wife. They wantonly, wantonly burned his home and destroyed all his property. They confiscated silver, clothing, china, food, and drink. They piled up his extensive library and burned it in the presence of his wife. Then with undue brutality, they seized his, his aging wife. She was held in a closely confined quarters in a prison with no bed to lie on or even a change of clothes for several months. The aging woman slept on the floor of an unheated prison with a slop bucket at her side. She was held for two years before George Washington was finally able to arrange her release on a prisoner exchange. But her health was irreparably damaged by the effects of her imprisonment, and she died shortly after her release. Philip Livingston, all of his business interests fell into the hands of the British. His mansion on Duke Street was seized by the British and turned into a barracks for enemy troops. His 150,000-acre country estate was seized by the British and turned into a naval hospital. But he continued to contribute his dwelling fortune to Congress for the war effort. He died less than two years after the revolution from the toll taken on his health. John Witherspoon, his son James, was killed at the Battle of Germantown. He had come to America at the request of others to start a college to train preachers. It became Princeton University. 
The British destroyed his college. They destroyed his library. He had built up over 3,000 volumes at the time. The British destroyed his farm. William Williams and his wife opened their home to American soldiers and French allies. He sacrificed his fortune to purchase supplies repeatedly and went door to door throughout his district, raising funds, collecting blankets and lead for American soldiers. He collected more than 3,000 blankets and large quantities of lead by removing lead weights from cloths at people's, with people's permission. He had a reputation for being scrupulously, scrupulously honest in his dealings. He seldom got to bed before 2 a.m. because he was working tirelessly for freedom. One night, while housing two members of the Committee of Safety in his home, they discussed the dangers should they fall into the hands of the British. Mr. Williams remarked that he would probably be hung for signing the Declaration of Independence and writing many public papers. One of the gentlemen observed that he himself had neither signed the Declaration nor written anything in opposition to the Crown, so therefore was secure from the gallows. To this, Mr. Williams instantly replied, then, sir, you ought to be hanged for not doing your duty. So dedicated were these men, they were willing to risk it all for our freedom. It's just, it is amazing. I just want to tell you a couple hands of instances of God's providence in behalf of the colonies. One happened at Dorchester Heights. At the time, the British were occupying Boston 10,000 strong. Washington felt compelled to fortify Dorchester, Dorchester Heights, sorry, that's my Boston accent, to try to drive the British away. During the night, the soldiers carried bales of hay, drove wagons with fortification supplies up the hill in darkness and utmost quietness. I was born in Dorchester, by the way. It was a hazy night down at the foot of the hill, that is. But once the men got to the top, it was crystal clear and they could see to build the fortifications. In the morning when the British general awoke, he was stunned to see the colonial army occupied the hill. He was reported to have said, the American army got more done in one night than my men would have gotten done in six months. Still, however, he prepared his cannons to take the hill. The colonists had no cannons at this point. They were coming from Fort Ticonderoga. Henry Knox was bringing them, but he hadn't arrived yet. And that night, a terrible natural disaster occurred in favor of the American troops. A terrible storm blew up such as no one had ever seen. It blew the British ships into disarray and broke their masts. In the morning, the general saw his ships were wrecked, and he knew that by the time he got things repaired, the Americans would really have an advantage. Reverend William Gordon, a local preacher, later said, when I heard in the night how amazingly strong the wind blew, I pleased myself with the reflection that the Lord might be working delivery for us and thus prevent the diffusion of blood, of human blood. It proved to be so. Without shedding a drop of blood, the British quickly drew their 10,000 soldiers from the city of Boston on March 17, 1776. This victory at Dorchester Heights gave great confidence to the Americans. I wish I had time to tell you about the Battle of Long Island. There's so many instances. It's so amazing. It's so exciting. But Edmund Burke once said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And that is kind of the state I see in our country. Satan has duped Christians into believing to be really spiritual. You must stay within the four walls of your church. Don't get involved with the world. Politics is a dirty business. Yes, it is, but that's because the salt and light have pretty much abandoned it. And it didn't used to be that way. We need to get back involved in the public arena. But the first step is teaching our kids these truths. And that's why... I hope this podcast will inspire you. The stories of all of these 56 signers are in this book. For you, they signed. When I, so as I was doing the research for this book, I was astounded by the character that I saw in these 56 men. And as you know, we have character concepts, our business, where we write character curriculum from preschool through high school. So. I recorded what these, the men believed about Jesus Christ. I recorded their stories. I recorded the sacrifices they made for our freedom. But I also included an ebook so that families could study these men together. 
And in the ebook, it's got, I think, a couple hundred pages in it. It's got pictures, like coloring pages, of each of the signers. So if you wanted to read about them as a family, there's questions at the end of each chapter. There's also questions in the ebook. There's fun quizzes for families to do together so that they can learn about the signers, like which signer did such and such, which signer said such and such, which signer sacrificed in this way. So there's fun ways for families to learn this together. There's coloring pages for your kids to work on as you're reading the information to them. It's also got the option where it's a curriculum for high school and it's got a teacher guide that comes with that if you wish to use it in that way. But if you just want to do it as a family to teach your kids about the signers of the Declaration of Independence, it is set up that you can do that in the free ebook. There's a code in the book that gives you the the uh, code, there's a, yeah, to, to access the ebook for free. So there's a couple other resources I just wanted to mention at the end. As I wrote that book, I came across a lot of other men from this time period that were not signers of the Declaration, but they were involved in the War of Independence. And the stories were so incredibly engaging that we had to write this second book called Profiles of Valor, Character Studies from the War of Independence. And you will hear about men like John Adams, John Re Reverend Jonathan Mayhew, Peter Salem, Henry Knox, Oliver Walcott, he's in there, um, John Glover, Horatio Gates, Marquis de Lafayette, George Rogers Clark. There's so many people that were not signers that I had to write another book to tell you their stories too. And that also is very good for family devotions. There's questions at the end of each of those chapters. I think there's 43 chapters. Then several years later, Master Books asked Rick and I to write history books about the War of Independence. So we've written to the fight for freedom and we found, you know, to do the research for these books, we actually used textbooks that were used in the public schools back in the 1800s, many textbooks that were used. And we found that again and again, they told the same stories again and again and again. They used to teach history through storytelling. And that's how kids remember it. If it's just a bunch of facts and dates, it goes in one ear and out the other. But when you tell through the stories, the lives of real people, the kids retain it and remember it. Daniel Morgan, Daniel Boone, Francis Marion, John Hancock, Lydia Dara, Nathaniel Green, John Sevier, Patrick Henry, Simon Kenton, William Moultrie, Israel Putnam. There's so many people. It tells their story. And throughout the book, um, they learn facts about what happened during that time period as well. The second one, America's struggle to become a nation, is the same. It's, it tells about miraculous events. It tells why there is a war of independence. It tells about some of the different battles. But it also tells about the US Constitution and how our country was set up. It's got a whole section on the Constitution. And it helps teach kids how this wonderful country was laid, the foundation that was laid to make it into the country that it is, the republic that it is. But again, it is told through stories. And like the pursued fox turns, um, retreat and victory, the mighty redcoats roll on. And it also builds character. Endurance is the inward struggle to endure tribulation with determination. Washington was discouraged, but he would not give in and quit. He continued to endure, read on to find the outcome. So there's little call-outs in there to make it interesting. It tells the real stories of people. It tells some providential accounts that occurred, like I told you about the Battle of, um, of Dorchester Heights. It tells about Long Island. I hope that these resources will help you to be able to treat, to train your kids and to teach your kids foundational principles our country was founded upon that they need to know today to preserve our freedom. We are fast losing our freedom. Statues are being torn down. Political correctness is taking over. Kids don't know history anymore. 
You know, back in the 1800s, those textbooks that we used to write these books, everybody knew the stories. It was common knowledge, and we've lost it. We're losing our history as a country, and we need to regain that history. We need to teach our families. We need to teach our families. We need to include other families, and our kids need to be knowledgeable about the foundations of our country. It is so crucial in this day in which we live. So I hope you will find this helpful. In the show notes, I will give you links. We offer the America's Struggle um, to Become a Nation, the Fight for Freedom, Profiles of Valor, and for you they signed as a package deal for a cheaper price if you choose to buy it that way, or anything can be bought individually. I will also put in the show notes a link to a post on my blog about how we celebrate Independence Day. And in that post, you will find some of the words of the signers like I read to you, what they believe about Jesus Christ and what they sacrificed for our freedom so that you can pass those out and let your guests read them on your independence celebration, which is what we do every day for independence, every year for Independence Day. Thank you for joining me today. As you can tell, I am passionate about the founding of our country and our, the signers of the Declaration and the godly heritage that we have to share with our family. So thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.